I want to bring in Brian Clark now. He's a senior fellow and director at the Hudson Institute after spending years in the U.S. Navy, and he is joining us now to talk more about the battle. Uh, let's start where Kelly picked off, though, that um, the U.S. military and the Russian forces not in communication, not answering the calls. What do you make of the status of where we stand right now? Uh, well, Marnie, uh, it, it's a big problem because uh, when you get into these uh, situations where things might escalate, so for example, there's a, a perceived chemical weapon use on the part of Russia uh, against Ukraine, uh, there may be a, a you know, desire to you know, communicate directly and find out, did this really happen? What is your intent? You know, what's the Russia's next move going to be? And try to defuse that situation before it's necessary for NATO to come in and have an immediate response. Uh, but without the ability to communicate, uh, the U.S. and NATO might be forced to respond militarily without the benefit of any uh, dialogue prior to that. Yeah, extremely troubling. Uh, Brian, Ukraine's Navy says it did sink that large Russian landship near the port city today. Do you think that we're going to be seeing more of that um, because the water right there is so strategic? Uh, absolutely. I'm surprised that we haven't seen more of it up to this point. I think the Ukrainian military has been sort of uh, keeping its powder dry, if you will. Uh, they've got some ballistic missiles, which were reportedly used in this attack today. And also they've got some uh, anti-ship missiles that they've uh, gotten from Europe over the years that have been that could be very effective going against these Russian ships. So I think we're going to start to see an escalation on the Ukrainians' part going after some of these ships in the Black Sea because uh, they make great targets. They're, they're close to shore. In this case, they were in port. Uh, and it's an opportunity for the Ukrainian to impose some costs on Russia. And you've seen Ukraine make some gains over the last several days, and this might be part of that. Mm -hmm. On that point, uh, one of your colleagues, Arthur Herman, raised uh, this mm -hmm. issue recently. He said that Ukraine not lose what remains of its Black Sea coastline, that Russia not consider that international body of water its private naval and maritime preserve. Explain the importance of not just this waterway, uh, but, but other inlets and areas um, on the water um, logistically. Well, part of what uh, Russia was trying to do with the seizure of Crimea is to get a warm water port uh, that allows it access to the sea year round. Um, so Crimea and Sebastopol gives, gives them that. Uh, and if they were to take Odessa, they would essentially take the whole Ukrainian coastline away from Ukraine, make Ukraine landlocked, essentially, uh, and give Russia multiple ports along the Black Sea that give it access to warm water uh, in the Mediterranean. Um, also, if, if Russia was to get the majority of the Black Sea coastline, uh, it and Turkey would control most of it. And then it might leave uh, Romania uh, and Bulgaria, which are also on the Black Sea, with few options to be able to get out to open ocean. So Russia could exert a lot of control over the Black Sea were it to gain control of the entire Ukrainian coastline. Mm -hmm. Brian, I said weeks ago, looking out at those Russian warships, that fleet in the Black Sea, it was a really eerie picture. Um, what are their capabilities? So the, the Russians have uh, more than a dozen ships in the Black Sea. Um, some of these tank landing ships, like you saw, parked in port uh, outside of Mariupol. Uh, but some of them are submarines. They have kilo-class uh, diesel submarines in the Black Sea that are home ported there um, that are very capable. Uh, they have anti-ship missiles. They have torpedoes. Uh, and they could use those to go and attack uh, U.S. and allied shipping, not just in the Black Sea, but then go out into the Mediterranean and do that as well. So the Black Sea is very strategic in that it has that direct access to the Mediterranean and the eastern Mediterranean, where a lot of U.S. allies uh, operate and, and require access to the ocean for maritime trade. We've talked a lot about the water. Let's talk a little bit about the air. You've made the argument that more air defenses need to be added to support Ukraine's military. Is that in addition to the javelins, the stingers, the drones that we know uh, were, being, right. were being sent? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the challenges that we're, we're having right now is that Russia is able to launch long-range missile attacks against uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, shopping malls, uh, hospitals, uh, theaters, et cetera. Those long-range missiles are being launched from airspace, Russian airspace, in most, for the most part. So uh, to be able to defend against that, you need a more capable missile defense system, uh, like the S-300, which is a Russian system that is uh, currently in possession by a lot of NATO allies in the east, uh, or the Patriot system, which is what the U.S. uses and a lot of NATO allies already employ. Uh, there's also some, uh, some other uh, European systems that could be sent over to Ukraine that are relatively easy to set up and learn how to operate. But you really need those kind of missile defenses in order to defeat these long-range cruise missiles and ballistic missiles that Russia can send into uh, Ukraine and attack these fixed targets uh, or attack these humanitarian corridors. Where, where, how do you evaluate the situation on the ground right now when we're seeing the destruction? Kind of who has the upper hand at this point four weeks in? 
Well, uh, Russia still has the upper hand in that they've got the they've got a larger number of troops in the country. They're making slower progress, but they're still making progress. I think we have to make sure that we don't get too optimistic about Ukraine's uh, chances here. So Ukraine's done a great job of slowing the Russian advance and imposing some losses on Russia. But Russia still has the upper hand in terms of just numbers uh, and the ability to sustain the fight for some period of time. Um, I think there's an opportunity here, though, with uh, what you see Ukraine making some breakthroughs of the Russian lines attacking some ships, as we saw here, if they were to get some more help from NATO, which they are in terms of lethal aid, and then maybe some protection of the humanitarian and uh, support corridors from uh, Poland and, and from uh, the West, you'd be able to keep that fight going. And maybe uh, Ukraine could gain the upper hand over the next several weeks. But we're looking at weeks to months of operations still before one side or the other gets the, the victory. Yeah, a long way to go. Uh, Brian Clark, always appreciate your insight. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact driven, unbiased coverage.